Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now the year 1703 was an eventful year throughout the world. According to Wikipedia in February, soldiers at Fort Louis de la Mobile celebrated Mardi Gras, the oldest uh, carnival celebration in the United States, and it started the tradition in Mobile, Alabama. It was some 15 years before the founding of New Orleans. In May, the city of St. Petersburg in Russia was founded following Peter the Great's reconquest of Ingria from Sweden during the Great Northern War. In July, Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe, is placed in a pillory and then imprisoned for four months for the crime of seditious libel after publishing his satirical political pamphlet called The Shortest Way with the Dissenters. He was released sometime in November. Also in July, the man in the iron mask dies in the Bastille in France. Isaac Newton is elected president of the Royal Society, a position he will hold until his death in 1727. And in June of 1703, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, is born. Welcome to our first in our new sermon series, Wesley and the People Called Methodists. Uh, it's our new sermon series on Methodism, and there's so much to learn about our history and the influences that have led us to where we are today. So starting next week, we are going to take a look at what is known as the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, although we will discover that Wesley himself never actually used the term. The quadrilateral actually describes uh, the process that Wesley used to, to meet and to know God, namely through scripture, tr tradition, reason, and experience. And then in our final week, we're going to explore the idea of grace and understand grace uh, in Wesleyan thought and how important grace is in our lives. So we're going to be looking at how do we know God and what do we know about God. But today we're going to start at the very beginning. A very good place to start, or so I've heard. And for Wesley, the beginning is with uh, his parents and his childhood, and especially for the role and influence of his mother, Susanna Wesley. It's fitting for this to fall on Mother's Day because Wesley's mother played a really significant role in his life, and her teachings held an indelible impact on uh, all of her children. But before we start, I just want to lift up the fact that Mother's Day is a day that can often bring a lot of complexity. All of us have mothers, some of whom are with us and some have gone to join the church eternal. Some of us may have had strong and healthy and wonderful relationships with our mothers and some of us maybe not so much. But this is the day that comes around every year, a day to, to celebrate women and mothers for their important role of mothering children. It's a day when women uh, might be struggling or grieving over their inability to have children, or maybe even over the loss of a child. In the United Methodist Church this, this week, um, and stretching through this month, is actually known as the Festival of the Christian Home. It's this recognition that mothers and fathers play an important role in teaching and shaping the faith of their children. And we also should acknowledge all of the grandmas and grandpas, all of the aunties and uncles, the adults of the church community who teach and lead and model for the children around them, either directly or indirectly, because we know that, that children watch us pretty closely and they mimic uh, and they learn from what they see us do. So our passage this morning from Proverbs, Proverbs 31, is it's a fascinating text. It, it talks about this Proverbs 31 woman in a passage that's titled Odes to a Capable Wife. This passage has been lifted by many Christian circles as God's ideal for a woman. There have been books and devotionals and conferences and Bible studies that have viewed this text and used it as a commandment, as a standard for women of how they ought to be. 
But as we heard this text this morning, this list of attributes, it seems like an insurmountable ideal, right? An impossible um, pedestal to reach for us sometimes. But instead of viewing this passage as a commandment for women, something that they need to strive to live up to uh, throughout their lives, this passage is, is really, it's a beautiful poem. It's an ode. It's commemorating and lifting up and celebrating a woman's skilled work in whatever form and guise it presents. For this is this passage is an, uh, an acrostic poem. It's a 22-line poem in which the uh, first word of each verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We find it in the last chapter of Proverbs, and uh, it's about a wife of noble character, a tangible expression of the book's celebrated virtue of wisdom. And some might even look to this poem and Proverbs 31 as wisdom personified in a woman. Verse 10, a capable wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Rachel Held Evans was an American Christian columnist, blogger, and author. She was a, a wife and a mother of two young children uh, when she tragically passed away in 2019 at the age of 37. Well, one of her books, her second book, was, was entitled A Year of Biblical Womanhood. And it's a, it's a beautiful and charming book in which she took a year of her life working through the commands to women throughout of scripture. And of this passage, she, she looked at Proverbs 31 in great detail. And of this passage, she says this. Take Proverbs 31 for an example. As it turns out, we have a woman to thank for this ancient acrostic poem that outlines in excruciating detail the daily activities of an excellent wife, perpetuating a 3,000-year-old inferiority complex among just about every woman in the Judeo-Christian tradition. The poem is recorded in the Bible by King Lemuel as an oracle that his mother taught him. The Proverbs 31 woman rises before the sun each day. She plans every meal. She strengthens her arms. She goes to the market. She brings home exotic foods. She runs a profitable business, dresses her husband and children, invests in real estate, cares for the poor, compliments her husband, spends hours at the loom, and burns the midnight oil before starting it all over again the next day. This, according to the oracle, is what a man should look for in a wife. Which, of course, leads me to believe that King Lemuel's mom was the kind who didn't actually want to have a daughter-in-law. Add a shrug of the shoulders and the accent of a Jewish grandmother to a wife of noble character who can find, and you get the idea. However, as the leaves began to turn and day one of the year of biblical womanhood loomed before me, I found myself inexplicably drawn to Proverbs 31, 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. According to United Methodist historians, Susanna Wesley was born on January 20th, 1669. She never preached a sermon, published a book, or founded a church, yet she is known as the mother of Methodism. She was the youngest of 25 children. And when she married the Church of England, Pastor Samuel Wesley, she bore him 19 children, 10 of whom lived until adulthood. And she was in charge of the early education of the children and instituted an evening hour with the children one-on-one, -on -one, individually, each week. And usually she had at least four of the five, four or five of the children at home with her at any, any given time. When the children were small, she developed a remarkable and effective method of education and spiritual nurture. As they grew older, she wrote manuals for them on such topics as the attributes of God, the Apostles' Creed, and the Holy Spirit. Her sons John and her son Charles 
and the other children, they relied on her wise counsel on matters spiritual, theological, and personal. Susanna was interested in learning and education. Even though she was not university educated, women couldn't enroll at the time, but she made sure that her girls were able to read as well as her sons. Now she and her husband Samuel had, had similar theological and political beliefs, though there is recorded a memorable episode in their marriage. Now Susanna and Samuel, neither one of them were fans of the current monarch, the King of England, William the Orange, or King William the Third. However, Samuel was, was willing to lift up in prayer the king. Um, Susanna, on the other hand, she considered James II to be the true king. So when her husband Samuel lifted up these prayers for the king, she could not do it. She couldn't bring herself to say amen at the end of those prayers. And so according to Richard P. Heitzeratter in his book called Wesley and the People Called Methodists, in their subsequent argument, Samuel was known to say, if we have different monarchs, then we shall sleep in different beds. And so Samuel left the family for a prolonged visit of time to visit London. And he only returned home after Anne ascended to the throne and became the new monarch who was mutually acceptable to both of them. And within a year, John Wesley was born. The fruits of reconciliation. Now Samuel was uh, a pastor. He was the rector of the parish at Epworth. And he was also involved in a movement, in a local society, if you will, known as the SPCK. This is a Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. And this group was a group of people gathering together to express Christian piety and also social concern. Now these societies were formed to work to reform England, but they didn't want to do it with one grand stroke. Their vision was to, to transform England by changing one person at a time. And uh, Heisenrader points out that they worked first with those with whom uh, there seemed to be some hope for moral improvement. I love that. So Samuel established this society at Epworth and it consisted of 12 members and they wanted to intentionally keep it somewhat small. So when the society began to grow, what would happen is they would break off and form a new society. Two members of the original society would then, would then go off and start to form this new society. Kind of like small groups or, or church planting that we can see today. But these societies were still supposed to be within the, the boundaries of, of church doctrine and church polity. And so we have this instant in Susanna's life when Samuel writes to her from London. We remember that he is there on an extended stay, right? So Samuel writes to Susanna because he's a little bit concerned. Susanna has begun to invite neighbors to come to their home on Sunday evening for prayers. And Samuel is a little concerned that this might be interpreted as a worship service in a private home, something which the church just didn't allow. Heisenrader writes that Samuel's strong words to his wife in a letter from London were met with a uh, typical strong retort by strong-willed Susanna, who felt that if Samuel hadn't left the parish in the hands of such an inept curate, she would not have had neighbors begging to come into her home for some spiritual nourishment. And she ends her letter to Samuel by saying this. I love this. She says, if you do, after all, think fit to dissolve this assembly, send me your positive command in such full and express terms as may absolve me from all guilt and punishment for neglecting this opportunity of doing good when you and I shall appear before the great and awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heitzenrader concludes by saying that Samuel's response is lost, as probably it was on Susanna. A capable wife, who can find? The Hebrew for this term is eshet chayil, and you'll find many different translations for this phrase, depending on the Bible that you are reading. The New Century Version, it's, it's a good wife. 
In the New American Standard, it's an excellent wife. Common English Bible, a competent wife. Good News Translation, a capable wife. New Living Translation, a virtuous and capable wife. New International Version, a wife of noble character. King James Version, a virtuous woman. American Standard Version, a worthy woman. And the Douay Rhymes American Edition, a valiant woman. Rachel Held Evans, however, points out that the majority of scholars feel that this phrase, that this Hebrew Heshet Chayil is best translated as a valorous woman, a valorous woman, a woman of valor. Because the structure and the words used in this Proverbs 31 poem closely resemble the heroic poems celebrating the exploits of warriors. For example, in verse 15, the food that she provides for her family, literally the word means prey. In verse 11, her husband lacks nothing of value, literally booty. In verse 27, was watching over the affairs of her household, the word literally means spies. And when she girds herself with strength, it is literally girding her loins and when can, she can laugh at the days to come, she is literally laughing in victory. This woman of valor is a heroic woman. The Proverbs 31 woman can be viewed many different ways. She can be seen as the personification of women. She can be seen as all of the attributes and traits of a woman that fears the Lord, the qualities and a character of a woman who is humble before God. For this idea of fearing the Lord is what this poem is ultimately about. And fearing the Lord isn't having uh, worry or anxiety that one lives with, but instead it's, it's someone who, who lives in the light of God with awe and with wonder, gratitude, and humility. A life well lived, a life of faith. So Rachel Held Evans reached out to a, a Jewish woman named Hava uh, to help her understand this passage a little bit better from a Jewish perspective. And Ahava explained that she gets called an Eshet Chayil, a woman of valor, all of the time. Make Chala, instead of buying it from your local store, Eshet Chayil. Work to earn some extra money for the family, Eshet Chayil. Make balloon animals for the kids at Shul, Eshet Chayil. She went on to say that in Jewish culture, men memorize this passage to recite or sing this poem to their wives at the Sabbath meal. It is a blessing, one to be given unconditionally. Evans went on to write how her husband, Dan, took this to heart. And she wrote, my heart swelled in my chest and it would again and again in the months to come as Dan found ways to invoke this new blessing in the midst of our daily routines. When my blog sold enough ads to become profitable, he looked up from the computer and he smiled and declared, woman of valor. When I finally got around to cleaning our guest room closet, he high-fived me and shouted, woman of valor. When I stumbled through the front door after a really long day with nothing but takeout pizza for dinner, he stretched out his arms in absolute delight and cried, pizza, woman of valor. It's amazing what a little poetry can do for a marriage. From Paul's letter to the church in Rome, he lifts up this beautiful passage about the peace that we have with God being justified by faith. He speaks of the grace which surrounds us and the hope that we have. Recognizing that the faith that we have doesn't necessarily remove the sufferings that we will experience in this life. But he lifts up this idea that, that suffering produces endurance, character, and hope through the love God has poured into our hearts. Susanna Wesley experienced great tragedy throughout her life. With the loss of a number of her children, fires that burned down the family home on multiple occasions, a husband who was often away. But she remained steadfast. She endured and she trusted in God and passed that along to her children. She had hope, truly a woman of valor. And on this Mother's Day, 
May we look around and may we speak blessings to the women in our lives. Maybe some are mothers and some are not. But what a gift to encourage women around us to name and lift up the ways that you are a woman of valor. Through your teaching and example, for the ways in which you try and fail and try again. For your journeys of faith, seeking and asking and trusting in God. For your awe in light of the beauty of God's creation and your humility in your care for those around you. Shet Chayil, woman of valor. Amen.